This is Tim, and this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics, special Thursday edition. This is Tim in Tokyo. We haven't heard all my audio from Minneapolis yet, but I'm shelving that for the time being and moving on to Columbus, where I visited the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum at Ohio State University. One of the people I talked with there was Jenny Robb, curator of the museum and an associate professor at Ohio State. I asked her about the museum's 40th anniversary exhibit and how the museum chose which comics to include. Also, how is it that comics became such a male-dominated field? How was color information for Windsor McKay's newspaper comics sent to other papers 100 years ago? Plus, a 1950 incident where famous cartoonists drew on women's bathing suits with the women still in the suits. Also in this episode... My phone interview with Mike Curtis, who currently has writing duties on Dick Tracy. On his watch, Dick Tracy won the Harvey Award for Best Syndicated Strip in 2013, 2014, and 2015. Mike's been in comics for some time. He was among the last writers to work on Harvey Comics in the late 80s. We talk about some decisions he's made as Dick Tracy writer, such as the inclusion of characters from other classic strips his Shanda the Panda series, and more. Jenny Robb in a moment. First, just a reminder that you can help this podcast by making your Amazon purchases via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon, and make that your bookmark for future purchases. We'll then get a percentage of what you spend. It costs you nothing extra and helps us cover web hosting and the other costs of presenting this show every week. We really appreciate your support. I'm talking with uh, Jenny Robb, who is curator and associate professor at Ohio State University at Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum. So, Hello. How are you? Very good. How are you? Okay. Um, yeah. So hmm. what was your path to working here? How did you end up at the Billy Ireland Museum? That's a good question. Uh it's a, it's the kind of job that that there aren't very many of in this world. Yeah. So I'm very I feel very lucky to have right. it. Right. All the listeners are jealous of you. <laughs> I imagine. I um, studied history, so my undergraduate work was uh, in the history department. Hmm. And in the summer between my junior and senior year, I got a grant to do a special research project, and I was uh, interested in studying images of Victorian working class women which sounds very boring. Uh, And I was, you know, researching in Ohio. I went to Wittenberg University, and uh, I discovered that there weren't very many primary source collections with images of Victorian working-class women Mm. until I discovered Ohio State and what was then called the Cartoon Research Library and a run of Punch magazine. And I found the the most rich resource of images Mm. was cartoons. And they were fascinating to me because, you know, they were by men, they were by upper class men, but it told me a lot about the status of working class women and how they were perceived and uh, what their lives were like to see how they were portrayed in these cartoons. Mm -hmm. And from there I was just hooked. I just thought, this is such a fascinating historical source. Um, I want to do more with cartoons. And so I went to graduate school in history and I eventually also did a master's in museum studies and I focused on the history of cartoons and comics. Uh, and so that led me to doing an internship here with Lucy Caswell, who was then the curator um, of the Cartoon Research Library. And uh, ultimately, I ended up back here working for her uh, in 2005. So mm-hmm. that I, okay. I specifically studied history. I specifically studied the history of cartoons and also curation, how to curate exhibits, how to curate collections, um, information management related to collections, uh, and so this really was the perfect job for me. So, mm. <laughs> so thank goodness this place exists, and yeah. I was able to come here. Well, were you much of like a comics reader before, like growing up, or? I was a newspaper comics reader. Okay. I wasn't a comic book reader. 
uh, until I started getting more interested and, and started seeing the connections between newspaper comics and political cartoons and what was going on in the comic book world. Mm -hmm. um, but I always, always read the newspaper comics, and uh, you know, ever since I was little, I would read every single one, even the soap opera ones that I didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Um, okay, so the Billy Ireland Museum is having its 40th anniversary, although the name has changed a couple times in there. But the name has changed about four or five times. So, <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we're, but we've been around for 40 years. Uh, in fact, my predecessor, Lucy, who I mentioned, mm -hmm. um, started work May 1st, 1977, on the Milton Kniff collection because that was our founding collection. Right. And so we, we count 40 years from then. Hmm. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, Amy was showing me around upstairs, and uh, Steve and Craig, we were all lo looking at stuff, and <laughs> and you know, Steve was able to tell us a lot of things about what was in you know, oh, what we were looking at that uh, Amy wasn't aware of. Um, but yes, so tell us about some of the stuff that's that's in the this ex 40th anniversary exhibit. So the 40th anniversary exhibit that we have on display right now uh, is separated into two different parts. So the first part was curated by Lucy Caswell, and it's uh, highlighting the first 10 years of what has become the Billy Ireland Cartoon Library and Museum, so the, the initial collections that came in. Uh, and we also wanted people to understand that when Lucy was starting this in the 1970s, mm -hmm. uh, People in universities did not understand why anyone should be collecting yeah, comics kind of and cartoons. Yeah, kind of amazing that it existed that long ago. <laughs> you know, it was really the, the early days of pop, pop culture studies. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people in academia really didn't quite understand what she was trying to do. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, while now we're very used to comics in the classroom in, in college campuses and, mm -hmm. and high schools and, and uh, in public libraries, um, when she started, that was really unusual, and mm. she had a, a real uphill battle to try and convince people not only that we should be collecting this material, um, but that it should be preserved in a, a special collection, like a rare books room. Mm. Uh, because to a lot of people, you know, this was just junk. This should be recycled. Yeah. Uh, and so she, she did a lot of heavy lifting and I think made a huge difference uh, in terms of how uh, people in academia viewed cartoons and comics and, and popular culture in general. Mm -hmm. And she was right. You know, we do have many people now who want to study popular culture. It's, it's mm -hmm. consumed by so many people and has such an impact. And so, um, you know, we're, I'm grateful to her and to many of the other pioneers mm -hmm. who really did that hard work uh, back in the day when, you know, people were, were not in favor of it. Mm -hmm. So you said the two, there are two parts of this exhibit and the first half was curated by her? Yes, so okay. the first half was curated by her and covers the first 10 years of collecting. Uh, and then the second part uh, is curated by Caitlin McGurk, um, mm. our associate curator here for outreach and engagement, and myself. And what we were trying to do with that exhibit is to tell the stories behind the objects that we have here. So we collect original art, we collect archives, things like uh, the papers of cartoonists, letters and, and business papers. Um, obviously we collect books, comic books and graphic novels and all kinds of other books and periodicals related to cartoons and comics. So, um, but the question is, you know, why do we collect this? What, you know, what, what's the point? Why is it important for there to be, for this institution to exist? Mm -hmm. And so what we wanted to do was look sort of behind the objects. What do these objects tell us? What are the stories that, uh, that, we, can, that we can tell based on these objects? And so what you have up there is 40 stories, because we have 40 years. <laughs> um, and they're, they're chosen really, it's, it, they're personal, because they're things that Caitlin finds particularly interesting or illuminating, or that I find particularly interesting or illuminating. And they might, they're stories about... Uh, the artists about the specific titles or the or the books that that were created their um, stories about how those works impacted society mm -hmm. um, or the audience um, their books about specific pioneers so people who were breaking barriers um, you know women cartoonists people of color uh, et cetera so uh, and you know other other types of stories things like political cartoons um, we have a range over the last uh, century and more about gun control cartoons, mm, yeah, you know, to those. show that this mm. is a topic that has been has been controversial yeah, since the 19th century. You yeah. know, so we're it's nothing new that we're still 
um, having these debates. And, and so we tried to tell all different kinds of stories using the objects that we have in our permanent collection. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, hmm. So, yeah, what was the process like of deciding what to put in? Because you got <laughs> so much stuff here. Well, that was the real problem. So yeah. we started out with way too many stories that we wanted yeah. to tell, mm -hmm. uh, and we had to whittle it down to 40. And uh, there were a few at the very end that were like, no, we don't want to give that one up. But yeah. <laughs> But then we thought, well, there will be a 50th anniversary show, so maybe <laughs> <laughs> we can do 50 different stories. But what's interesting about it is that if anyone else had curated it, they would have picked different things. I mean, mm -hmm. may, there may have been some overlap, um, but what we what we didn't want to do, we didn't necessarily want to do just the, the highlights of the collection. You know, um, we've done that already, sort mm -hmm. of the real you know, special pieces, the really exciting pieces by the most famous artists. Uh, we weren't trying to do that. We were really trying to look at what are some interesting stories that people might not know mm. about these objects and be able to show some things that also maybe don't get a lot of attention mm -hmm. uh, because we want people to discover new things when they come here. Uh, if you're already a comics fan, you're going to see a lot of things that are very exciting and that, you know, that you already know about. Mm -hmm. But we also want to show things that you may not already have seen or you may not be aware of. Uh, because there is that, we hope, that element of discovery here with our collection, even for the true fans. Hmm. Um, so we were looking at, uh, well, someone here in the office was showing us some more of these costumes. Uh Made by what was the guy's name? Larry uh, Ivy. Larry, Larry Ivy. Yes. Yep. yep. Um, and one, there's a Captain America one that's up yep. in the gallery. Um, so now he, these were costumes that were made for films that he made. Yes. So he he was uh, very interested in comics, all all types of comics. He was um, you know a writer and artist himself. Um, but when he was younger, he made these amateur films, superhero mm. films, and he created these costumes uh, for that. So it's really an interesting early example of, of cosplay and of uh, using these characters to tell uh, your own story. And, you know, this is back in the day. Now everybody with a cell phone can make a movie, you know, but obviously mm. this was back in the day when you really had to be committed. <laughs> yeah, and this was when? Uh, I... I I would have to double check, but I well, think those so, costumes were from the '60s. Yeah, that's what we were thinking too. The the, yeah. the one in the exhibit it says '40s, which we okay. sort of weren't sure about because he was born in '36. So, but I mean, he might have done it when he was ten. I think I he know. was he was doing this sort of thing when he was mm -hmm. when he was very young. So, um, if the exhibit says '40s, that's probably the case. <laughs> okay, but yeah, then I guess there are these others that are not in the exhibit that are from more like the '60s. Yes, yes, Captain so, America and Batman and Robin and Superman. Yeah, yeah, and you know, who knew cosplay would become such a such a big thing mm -hmm. and, and something that so many people enjoy mm -hmm. and are involved with, um, but he was, uh, we think, one of the pioneers. Mm. Yeah. Um, and then there, next to that in the exhibit, there's um, something that was like draw, ballpoint... A bathing suit. <laughs> ballpoint drawings on a bathing suit. Yeah. Can you tell us about that. So that's a really interesting object. Um, the National Cartoonist Society, cartoonists, who of course were all at the time men, um, got invited to do an event that was meant to promote a new waterproof ballpoint pen. Hmm. And the idea was they had women models in these white bathing suits or light colored bathing suits and the cartoonists would draw their famous characters and sketches on the suits. And then they put dumped water onto the bathing suits to show how <laughs> the an ink excuse wouldn't for run. A t-shirt contest. <laughs> yeah, so it's a, a, obviously it was a different era then, yes. and it was an event that you know um, that we would probably wouldn't happen today. Although I guess you never know. Well, uh, if it did, Twitter would explode. Yes, but. exactly. <laughs> but what's really interesting about that, and we actually don't have this on the label, um, but though there were six of those bathing suits that were up for auction. And we saw them, and because we have the National Cartoon Society archives, we thought, you know, we really should have those in the collection because it's an important part of the history of the organization. Um, and so we bid on it. But, of course, we don't have a large budget for mm -hmm. acquisitions. Um, and we were very quickly outbid. Mm. And uh, months later, I was visiting a, a member of our National Advisory Council, uh, Tom Gamble, 
who's a writer for The Simpsons and uh, has his own comic strip, The Doozies. Uh, and he has a huge Ernie Bushmiller collection. And mm. so I visited him at his home, and I walked into his dining room where he had, had lots of uh, Ernie Bushmiller strips, and I look over, and there is one of the bathing suits on a mannequin. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, Tom, did you, did you just win this at an auction? And he said, yeah, just a few months ago. I, I was the top bidder, <laughs> and I won this. And I said, oh, my gosh, we were competing with you. <laughs> uh, so he really only bought the lot because he wanted the bathing suit that had Ernie Bushmiller's drawing. Wow. And he said, I would love to donate the other five because mm. I, I was really after this one, but I got six in the lot. And so we were thrilled because we really wanted them. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, and so he donated them to us. And uh, so it's, it's a great story because, um, you know, the, the object itself, but also how we ended up with it. Mm-hmm. I see. Uh, now, I understand that there was a little bit of controversy about the photo that's in the gallery that like shows one of these uh, events with the the women in the bathing suits and the guys drawing on them yeah i think the problem was when we first wrote the label uh we didn't specifically um call out the fact that we understood that this was somewhat of a sexist event that mm-hmm. you know again was very much a product of its time and 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 could obviously would you know be viewed as very inappropriate uh, mm-hmm. today. And so we, uh, a, a very nice patron, you know, pointed that out to us and we agreed and we actually rewrote that label and we did, uh, take one of the photos off. The photos are interesting too, because life magazine had sent a photographer. They were going to do a whole feature mm-hmm. on this event. Um, they took all the photos and then the magazine actually decided not to print them because they felt the photos were too racy mm. to put in Life magazine, which was a family magazine. Mm. Uh, so they ended up never getting printed in in that magazine. Mm. Um, so it's a, all around. It's a very interesting story, but I think something that does tell us a lot about uh, the uh, you know what was acceptable at that time, and uh, you know the roles of women and men, and also the celebrity of cartoonists. You know mm. that's another thing. Yeah. That, you know is is. <laughs> you know, ha- has changed. But at the time, you know, these newspaper cartoonists, most of them were newspaper cartoonists. Yeah, they were kind of rock stars. They were rock the stars. 30s and 40s. Yeah, they were, yeah. you know, people who would get a feature in Life magazine, and mm-hmm. you know, which would be read by millions of people. Uh, they were household names mm-hmm. uh, in a way that um, that is not the same. I wonder, you mentioned they were mostly men. How, how did it become such a male-dominated field for so long, I wonder? Uh, the you mean cartooning Car- in general? Cartooning in general, yeah. You know, it's. Um, I mean, that's an, that's an interesting question. I mean, obviously, women. Uh, there were women artists. There were women cartoonists. You mm-hmm. know, from the very beginning. Um, but I think, like many other professions, it wasn't considered newspaper. The newspaper business wasn't particularly considered uh, friendly to career women. Mm-hmm. Um, and the NCS, when it started, was all men. Uh, but very quickly, in fact, the same year as that event was the first year that women were admitted, women cartoonists were admitted. And Okay, what year was that again? Uh, <laughs> boy, I wish I had the label in front of me. 1950? Hmm, okay. Uh, we should double check that. <laughs> okay, yeah, the, the photo looked like it was from about that era, yeah, 40s, yeah, 50s. Yeah, um, and, I, and I would have to look again, but I, but I, when we did our research, hmm. the year of that event was the same year that they admitted three women um, uh, cartoonists to, uh, to, the, to the MCS for the first time. So already early on in the, um, in the history of the organization, uh, it became a, a, a mixed, mixed hmm. group. Okay, well, see. National Cartoonist Society started in 1946. So I think it would have been 1949 um, or 50. Yes. Uh, three women were finally admitted for membership in 1950. Yeah. Um, Hilda Terry, Edwina Dum, and Barbara Sherman. Yes. Barbara Sherman was a New Yorker cartoonist, um, and Hilda Terry uh, and Edwina Dum had comic strips. Hmm. So that was, okay. and they petitioned, um, hmm. yeah. and and people in the NCS had to agree that it was not right to exclude um, to exclude women hmm. who were professional cartoonists. Hmm. Um, for years, though, they sort of had an auxiliary club of the wives, and I. <laughs> um, hmm. But it's a, it's a it's a very diverse organization now. Hmm. Yeah, 
Yeah, well, it's interesting, too, you mentioned it was really considered part of the newspaper business, and we kind of forget that now because comics, as you know, comic books has really become kind of more dominant, and newspapers in general are <laughs> having problems. Yeah. Um, we don't really, you know, that's not as prominent as it was. That's true, but a lot of cartoonists at the time considered themselves journalists and, and had studios at the newspapers. Mm. Uh, and so they consider themselves part of that world, you know, particularly in the first mm-hmm. half of the of the century. Right. Yeah. It's, it's the twentieth century. Both pol- political cartoonists and yes. the regular funny strip cartoonists. Yeah, well, I remember. So I grew up in Iowa, and mm-hmm. the Des Moines Register used to have a cartoonist named Frank Miller, not the Daredevil right. Frank Miller, <laughs> but a different Frank Miller, who's they always put his cartoons on the front page. Yes. Which is kind of amazing to think about today but up, right, right up until he died in like about 1981 i think they were putting his cartoons on the front page well and that tells you something about the influence of these cartoonists and how well known they were and how mm-hmm. well liked uh, there are a lot of examples of political cartoons running above the fold on the front page yep. so that mm-hmm. tells you that, that that was selling the newspaper because mm-hmm. obviously what was above the fold on the front page is what they thought was going to sell the newspaper mm-hmm. the best um, and and there are many other examples of that that we have in our collection. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, we have an exhibition coming up, uh, which is going to look at immigration through the lens of cartoons and comics. Mm. And we have some cartoon, some uh, newspaper pages from the 19th century that have big, beautiful color political mm-hmm. cartoons. And we actually don't even know who drew them; they're unsigned. Um, this is a newspaper in Utica, New York. Uh, that are are fascinating, and they're above the fold on the front page of the newspaper. Mm-hmm. Would you happen to know? So we, when we were upstairs, and Stephen was saying he always wondered this, and nobody can seem to answer the question. Oh no, if Stephen can't answer it, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but we were looking. There's the Little Nemo cartoon on the wall, and there's the original art, and then there's as it was printed in the Cincinnati newspaper. Um. And he's wondering how they were able to send the color instructions through, you know, to send it to the papers that got it through the syndicate. You know, because techno- technologically you can't scan it right. or, or something. How, how did the papers know what colors to right. use? Right. So that particular example was only in the Cincinnati Enquirer. It was only, okay. okay. Right. So um, we, so the one you're talking about is, is an example of Tale of the Jungle Imps by yeah. Windsor McKay, and it was mm-hmm. his first comic strip. He actually didn't write it. He worked with a, a newspaper writer who wrote the, the poetry, and then uh, he illustrated it um, in his signature style. You can see you know, a lot of, of the things he was working out in that early example. Mm-hmm. Um, but that only appeared in the Cincinnati Enquirer, okay. and he hand-colored the Sundays, we think, to show the printer what he wanted. Mm-hmm. Now, the ones that were being distributed to many different newspapers, um, I believe uh, that what gets distributed are the four plates, so the four color plates. So that's mm-hmm. or and they send um, those through the mail then. Or we we also have examples of um, their molds that that would be sent out that are almost made of a paper uh, mm-hmm. um, material. And there's a specific name for them, and unfortunately I'm forgetting it right now. <laughs> okay. uh, but they would send those out, which would then be the uh, the metal plates would be made from those. Mm. Uh, and and I I'm not I am not an expert on you know exactly what the printing technologies were in each era so mm. um, you know there are probably people who could answer that better than me but just knowing from what we have in our collection that does seem to be the, a way that they avoided having to actually send out plates um, and also there was some consistency in terms of what was being printed from newspaper to newspaper mm. okay. But yeah, that one that you said is just in the Cincinnati Enquirer. Yes. The the coloring is pretty mm, sophisticated, and there are some places where there are, there's color that's there's no outline around it. It's exactly. just kind of like the shadows and yep. and he was pointing out the window. There's some you know, different shades of green out the window. Um, but yeah, the others, the ones that were really syndicated out to a lot of papers, maybe weren't the, weren't quite so complex. Perhaps. Exactly, yeah. and in, in the reason that w- what you just said is that there are changes in color based on how the original is painted that aren't 
based on you know where there are black lines. Mm-hmm. So so that's why we think the printer had that original that Winsor McKay had painted already mm-hmm. to use because he stayed so close to that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, I guess it's possible that somebody recreated what the printer had done on the original after the fact. You know, we don't know for sure because mm-hmm. we. We don't, you know, those pieces uh, in particular, that original is, is another interesting story. Um, we we don't know how the person who ended up with those got them. Uh, it was a printing company that uh, a woman came in. Uh, her grandfather had started the company. They were closing it down, and they found this old cardboard box with 11 of these original Windsor McKay's, but they didn't know that they're original or they didn't really know anything about comics and mm. so luckily it was in Columbus and they they found us um, mm. and we were able to acquire five of those 11 originals the other six went um, into the uh, uh, I think were auctioned or sold mm. um, to a dealer but uh, it was very exciting when she came in and said I've got these old cartoons and you know we never know what what's going to happen and she opened the box and there were you know 11 original Windsor McKay's uh, from Tale of the Jungle Imps prior to that we'd never seen an original from that strip and they were all thought to have been lost. But she had no idea how her grandfather ended up with them. <laughs> so, you know, we don't really know what the story is behind that. Huh, interesting. Um, another comment that was made upstairs among us was that, you know, going through the history of comics like this, it's hard to avoid uh, some things that would now be considered racist. Yes. Um, the Jungle Imps, I guess, well, yeah. Amy said, you know, there hasn't been much complaint about it from people who come to the museum, but, you know, it's kind of hard to, hard well, to miss it. You know, if you look at, at cartoons and comics um, from previous decades, I mean, even fairly recent, mm-hmm. <laughs> more recent than we would like to, to admit, um, unfortunately, there are a lot of racist images and, and to all different types of people. Um, and it's a, it's a reality, you know, that, that exists in our collection. It's part of the history uh, we do try to put it into context. You know, the last thing we want to do is to, you know, upset anyone who comes to, you know, enjoy the art. But, um, but it is a reality. And in, in fact, the exhibit I was just talking about, our immigration exhibit, you know, we we are going to have to really uh, work at how to how to put those cartoons in context mm-hmm. um, because, you know, many of them are, are very offensive. Um, and uh, you know, but the, but again, they they were what people were reading, so they had an impact on how people thought about people who weren't like them or immigrants. Um, you know, so uh, so we think it's important to to still be able to display them and to be able to talk about them, uh, but we do want to be careful and sensitive to the mm-hmm. extent that we can be. There's also a book I didn't. When we were kind of chatting, I didn't have enough chance to like read the note about it, but something called like black comics or Negro comics or something like yeah. that. What 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 is, what is that exactly? So that's a really interesting comic book. It was the first comic book that we're aware of that was uh, published by an African American using all African American creators. And what was it called exactly? It's called Negro Comics. Negro Comics, okay. And only one issue was ever published. Um, and it's very rare, hmm. uh, and that is from the Larry Ivy collection, okay. the, the same gentleman who made the costumes. And when did this come out? Um, 50s, 60s? Yes. Hmm. I believe it was in the 50s. Okay. <laughs> you can tell it, memorizing dates is not my thing. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting comic book because, of course, there was a thriving black press at the time, hmm. Uh Newspapers like the Chicago Defender and the Pittsburgh Courier, and they had their own cartoonists. Uh, we have some. We have a great collection by a man named Sam Millay, who was a cartoonist for the Pittsburgh Courier. Uh, but this was an effort to specifically reach out to a black audience um, with a, a black-owned and black-created uh, comic book. Mm. Mm, I see. Um, so I haven't, haven't looked at your website recently. Like, how, how much do you have there? I mean, you know, got listeners from you know, around the country and other countries, and um, who probably can't make it to Columbus necessarily. What what can they see on the website? Well, we have uh, two ways to really browse our collections. Okay. Um, one, and if you go to our homepage, uh, up on the upper right co- uh, corner, it says uh, you know search our collections. Um, and the two things I think would be most interesting for people, we have an art database, and that uh, about ha- more than half of the records 
in that database uh, have images associated with them. But that is all of the original art that we have in the collection. So mostly what you're going to get in that is, is what we have originals of. Mm. Uh, the other one is our digital collections, and it's, it's anything we've ever scanned from our collection. So you, you'll get a lot of original art there, but also things like photographs and things like uh, you know, scans from books or scans from tear sheets. So we have mm. the San Francisco Academy of Comic Art Collection, which is 2.5 million tear sheets, uh, comic strips from the newspaper. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that collection of itself is completely unique, yeah. could never be reproduced. <laughs> uh, and we've scanned thousands and thousands of pages from that of old newspaper comics that are very rare. And so anything that we've scanned from that collection and you know, only a tiny percentage of the 2.5 million uh, is actually scanned, but whatever we have scanned would be available in that database. So there, there's two different databases, and some there's some overlap, but those would both be fun if you just want to go and sort of browse, or if you have a particular title or artist that you're interested in, um, that's the best way to do it. Um, the art database of the original art is also handy for searching by subject. So if you are interested in cartoons of Jimmy Carter or um, cartoons of World War II, you can put in search terms like that, mm -hmm. and you know you'll get you'll get hits. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the best way digitally right now. We also have some uh, nice digital exhibits. So these are exhibits that um, either were created just uh, as digital versions or are digital versions of actual exhibits that we have done here, physical exhibits that we've done. And eventually we hope to make digital exhibits of all of our physical exhibits. Um, we haven't had the resources to do that yet, but yeah. we're hoping to. Yeah, it's a big um, job. So that, you know, this 40 stories would be available online for people. But they can go and look at, look at the past digital exhibits that we have. We have about, I don't know, 20 different ones. Some of them are um, about specific artists. Um, so that's another way that people can, can kind of browse and, and mm. see what we have in our collection. Yes, you did hear me talk about seeing Stephen Bissett at the Billy Ireland Museum. He's among my guests in next Monday's episode. Coming up in this episode, Mike Curtis talks about Dick Tracy, Shanda the Panda, the New Kids on the Block comics, and more. I'm putting enough work into podcasting that it feels like a full-time job, but I'm having trouble monetizing it at our current audience size. If you want to help support this podcast, Help us expand our audience by giving us a review on Apple Podcasts and anywhere else podcasts are found, and share episodes on social media. If more people are listening, not only does that mean more potential Patreon supporters at patreon.com slash deconcomics, but it would also become easier to get paying sponsors. Whether it's through your hard-earned cash or by spreading the word about the show, we really appreciate your support. This is an imaginary podcast, which may never have happened. The Shortbox Showcase. But then again may have. About a father and daughter. I'm Professor Allen. And I'm Emily. Who came from Ohio and talked about comics. Walking Dead. Tintin. Black Lightning. White Tiger. It tells of their rise to glory, when the great guests were yet to be booked. Let's put it this way, Shogun Warriors wasn't going to win any Eisners and the great feats of editing not yet performed. This is Ultra 7, this is Ultraman Jack, and this is Ultraman Taro, and this is Ultraman Leo, and this is Ultra Of how they spoke at length. This continuity is really the brainchild of nitpicking nerds the world over. But to be fair, the best kind of confession is the Force Confession. And reviewed in brief tales that explore creatively the bounds of a given character's history. Red Sun is wonderful with a very strange ending. Of brilliant creators before their fall from grace. This is the era where Miller is at the height of his creative and artistic powers, and the ability of strong writing to encapsulate and transcend its time. Flash of Two Earths by Gardner Fox. This is an imaginary podcast. Aren't they all? Shortbox Showcase is part of the relatively geeky family of podcasts. Check us out on the web at Relatively Geeky Podcast blogspot.com or search in iTunes for Relatively Geeky or Shortbox Showcase. And remember, we're not experts. We're just family. Okay, I'm talking with uh, Mike Curtis down in Arkansas. How are you doing? Doing fine. 
Okay. Um, yeah. So Mike is the current writer of Dick Tracy, um, and uh, you've done kind of a variety of other things too that I wanted to ask you a little about. Um, but what what kind of comics did you read when you were growing up? Oh, almost everything. Uh, <laughs> because at the time there was a in those days, you know, uh, there were so many different genres in comics. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be unusual to go to a comic uh, rack and pull off the Justice League and uh, Tweety Pie and Sylvester, you know, on the same thing. You could get almost anything in comics. Sure. Of course, nowadays, yeah, nowadays it's mostly superhero. Yeah, that's still mostly true. Um, now, I guess you were you did some writing on kind of the last gasp of Harvey comics. Uh, so, what was that experience like doing Richie Rich and Casper? Oh, I enjoyed it very much. In fact, uh, one thing I did for my own reference, I thought I could generate stories with it, which I could have, was I did a map of the Enchanted Forest, and my editor liked it so much he put it in all the books as a uh, centerfold. Oh, wow. So, you know, basically I was trying to introduce some continuity into the Harvey verse, like uh, why doesn't hot stuff ever interact with Casper or Spooky or any of them? Mm-hmm. But she doesn't. She does interact with Stumbo on occasion. So basically, I uh, divided these areas and put some people that interact close together and stuff, stuff like that. I see. Yeah, I always kind of wanted more interaction in those comics when I was reading them. Um, it seemed logical. Now, I guess you were also doing a New Kids on the Block comic? Yes, when they were popular. Uh, Harvey licensed them and uh, did quite a few New Kids on the Block comic books. But uh, yes, I was busy on that, too. <laughs> Interesting. Now, um, you've been doing Dick Tracy since 2011. Um, had you had you ever done a newspaper strip before that? No, that's the odd part. Never <laughs> had done a newspaper strip before that. Hmm. So, um, how how did that? Uh, I mean, it's it's a little bit different thing from writing a comic book. How did you have to kind of adjust your approach? Uh, definitely had to adjust. Uh, Joe and I both had to adjust our approach because. Some papers take Sunday, some take, papers take the dailies, some papers take both, mm-hmm. and you have to write it as uh, so that someone that gets either to Sunday or the dailies or both can get the story. So usually there's a lot going on, a lot of exposition going on during the week, and then usually on Friday it comes up to a climax, which is resolved on Sunday, and then has to be rehashed on Monday. I see, yeah. Now, um... I, when you when you started, I was struck, and I noticed looking. I was looking through some of those early strips on Go Comics and looking at the comments, and it seemed like other people noticed this too. That uh, your your story had a much faster pace than your predecessors did. Um, I think what uh, Dick Locker was writing it. Yeah, Dick Locker. Yeah, um, and. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, that version, his version, I felt like I could read it like three times a week and I wouldn't miss anything. Uh, where yours, uh, there's a lot more, it happens a lot faster. Um, what's what's your, been your approach to pacing the strip? Well, uh, originally we uh, had did for audition, we had done a very short strip uh, with uh, Fly Face and the Fifth, and then we uh, did one... Uh, with Flaky Biscuits for the website, and uh, these came into continuity, and they had asked us originally if we could do an adventure in three weeks, and we told them, no, you couldn't really do a a good Tracy adventure in three weeks. So they had us on a four-week deadline for a while, and then we expanded that to six weeks, and after a while they they just let us go on, you know, and just let us uh, do the the strip as as we wish to. I see. You know, as long or as short as we wish to. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I guess it's been working out pretty well because you got uh, the Harvey Award for Best Syndicated Strip, what, three years in a row? Three years in a row, yes. Now, has the 2016 award been given yet? Uh, not yet, no. Okay, so... This... But if, Bloom County's in, if Bloom County's in the nomination, most likely that's what will get it. I see. Yeah, because you got 2013, 14, and 15, but okay. So we don't know don't don't know yet for sure if you're getting 2016 or not. But um, yeah. now, um, so Joe Staten is that pronunciation correct? Staten? No, more like Staten. Staten. Okay. 
um, now he's drawing it and um, do you how, what's your working relationship with him do you consult a lot or do you just kind of send him the script and he draws it how, how, do, how does your partnership work oh we consult a lot on uh, primarily I'll, I'll run storylines past him and, and angles different things different characters past him and make sure that he's okay with it and that he likes it and such. And then it goes into the end of the script. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we talk about usually about three times a week. Oh, I had to ask you about this. You've had a lot of guests from other classic strips in Dick Tracy, uh, especially from the yeah. Little Orphan Annie cast. Um, now, are you, are you just kind of allowed to use anybody who's within the same syndicate? Or I was kind of like, how is this okay copyright-wise? We can use anybody that's in the uh, Tribune Syndicate, and we have to get permission from other characters, uh, like uh, with the, the Spirit when we did that. Right, because he wouldn't be in the in the Tribune Syndicate. But so, yeah, who, who did you have to ask then? The, the the Eisner Estate. The Eisner Estate. There was a uh, you may have noticed there was a copyright notice on that, and also on the uh, Fearless Fosdick uh, one week adventure we did. Oh yeah, that's right. Hmm. And so what kind of inspired you to start uh, using those uh, other classic characters? Well, basically, the uh, we had uh, the first one we used was uh, from Brenda Starr. A few people noticed it, then we used another character, and they noticed it more. So then we had Hot Shot Charlie from, uh, from Terry and the Pirates for about three days there, and people just went wild over it. <laughs> and we thought, well, that's good. We can have characters walk through, you know. It makes sense that they can walk through and occasionally do an adventure where, like the Annie adventure and the Spirit adventure, where the character crossover is, is the main focus of the adventure. I see. And I think in, in the Spirit when there was this, like, Dragon Lady character, was she out of Steve Canyon? No, or, she was out of Terry and the Pirates. Terry and the Pirates, okay. Well, right, right creator, anyway. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, that seemed like a Kniff character. Um, now, I was surprised that you sort of brought back Moon Maid. Um, of course, Max Collins killed her off when he took over. It's been almost 40 years ago now. Um, and I did a little research, and I, because I, I didn't quite know the, the background of it, um, but I guess that the character who became Moon Maid is someone who's been around, I guess, since Chester Gould was doing it, right? Yes. Um, and that it was... was a character. Yeah, uh, Glenda or Mindy uh, Ermine. That's right. Yes, yeah, she, she came in second in a Moon Maid look-alike contest. <laughs> I see. Now, um, was was that a controversial decision at all to bring to sort of bring back Moon Maid? Well, it was one that Joe and I discussed for some time, and that... Uh, the main thing that changed was we thought we would do just a, like, like a six-week story, and it uh, got so much response that basically we expanded the, the basic story in the background to almost a year's worth of adventures. Mm, yeah, yeah, that was, she was in for quite a while. I think she's still kind of in the background, right? She's still in, yeah. in town. And she'll be uh, very prominent in the uh, December adventure. Mm, okay. That start probably uh, tomorrow or the next day. Now, I'm I'm really curious, and you may, maybe this is kind of a secret if it's going to happen or not. But um, you had some characters, some bad guys who were in the space coop and got sent to Jupiter, <laughs> um, and I'm s- still kind of wondering if they're going to show up again. It's been a few years ago that they disappeared, but probably not. Most likely not. Uh, I, don't, I think we've seen the last of them. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, I was surprised in kind of researching this how many of the characters you've used have been established characters who you brought back. I wasn't aware of some of them, like like Mr. Bribery or whoever. Uh, you must have spent a lot of time reading the old strips. Actually, it was possible nowadays, uh, and with the help of someone who had collected the uh, Mike Killian strips, and gave me his copies. I read the entire, the entire uh, Dick Tracy canon, 
Wow. All 84 years of it. Yikes. Yikes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> it took quite a while to do it. Yeah. Now, was there was there like a, a hiatus there for a few years after Chester Gould died? No, no, no. It had been taken over while Chester Gould was still alive. Okay. Max Collins and Rick Fletcher did it, uh, and Gould's name stayed on it as advisor for some time. Okay. Well, when, when did he pass away? 1977. 77, okay. Because I remember the Des Moines Register picked up uh, picked up the strip in like 78 or 9, I think, uh, when Max Collins was writing it. Okay. Um, now, I guess, though, the, uh, Blackjack, is he an original character of yours? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I... I really like his uh, his um, mo with uh, playing tub thumping while he's robbing a bank. <laughs> yeah, that well, we kind of got that from Raven and Terry and the Pirates. Okay, uh, that, that uh, Kniff had always uh, just before she appeared, somebody would be playing or singing or having a record on that was St. Louis Blues. Mm. And that was always her theme song, and then st- suddenly she'd show up. So tub thumping is his song. Okay, why tub thumping? <laughs> just it just seems like him. I <laughs> I saw a video that had uh, some anime scenes, and it it kind of reminded me of Blackjack. Hmm. I see. Well, he's a lot like Lupin the Third, for instance. Ah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. But I mean, he he seems like such, especially after this last story. Uh, it seems like such a kind-hearted bank robber. Um, I almost kind of doubt that that machine gun is a real machine gun. It might be a super soaker or something. Um, no, he's a real bank robber. It's just he's very careful not to injure any... Uh, he's he's a 30s-style bank robber in the style of John Dillinger. He's, he tries to make sure no one gets hurt during his bank robberies, and he only robs banks that are currently unpopular because of the uh, response they're taking to things. Yeah, well, that, that last bank, what was it, the Fleischer Bank, was uh, having some yes, kind of Fleischer problem? Bank. Fleischer, you, you, was this a, a reference? I, I was thinking of Max Fleischer. Yes, it's, well, it's easy to, and fun names, if, if you have trouble with names anyway. <laughs> so, uh, you know, if, if I've got to put a name in, I might as well put something in that means something to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, I, I was looking at those your early strips, and and uh, just after Dick Locker left, and you had uh, like an auditorium named after Locker. <laughs> oh yes, mm-hmm. yeah. And the the first week we did it, we had uh, uh, Shruby Shrevnitz, who was the 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 uh, shadows uh, cab driver. Okay. And uh, he, he was giving a, a ride to uh, the Fly Face and the Fifth. Mm-hmm. We we started our very first week doing crossovers and get little guest star spots of people <laughs> well i mean dick tracy traditionally the, has character names that are kind of funny and tell us something about the character um do you have any particular favorites hmm and i've heard that question before huh i don't know i hmm. can't answer the question okay. because i really don't don't think i have any favorites uh I mean, like a morning, uh, morning Gloria was from uh, the song by uh, Gloria Esteban, mm. and uh, you know the lyrics of it directly inspired her. I guess that might be it. That the name came directly from the song because they talked about, uh, you know, is it, or is it the voices that you hear? And I decided, okay, this is somebody that was was a hippie once and got into the SDS, and when all that stuff died of old age or whatever, she kept on. Uh, funding terrorists and such, and people would, could come to her to get uh, equipment for terrorist stuff like a fertilizer and uh, stuff that you could make into bombs. Mm-hmm. So she was kind of an old hippie that was still working to <laughs> bring down the government. I see. Um, now, as newspapers are kind of hurting in the Internet era, um, what do you think the future is for syndicated strips? They're, they're always going to be around in some form or another. I'm sure of that. Mm-hmm. Uh, it may be just online. It yeah. may not be on paper. But uh, they'll be around in some line or some way or another. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I'm, that's how I'm reading them online. Of course, I'm, I, normally I'm in Japan where I 
they generally can't get them in a newspaper. But yeah. um, so I wanted to ask you about some of your other stuff. Uh, you you for a long time you did a comic book called Shanda the Panda. Yes. Um, now is it is it I have I wasn't able to get a hold of a copy of it. I I saw some stuff online, but um, uh, would it would it be fair to call it a furry comic? Yes, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> You're exactly on spot. Okay. Now, um, was it was it as adult as Omaha the Cat Dancer, or how would it compare with that that comic? It was a mature reader book, but occasionally we would do an adult story, mm-hmm. and occasionally we do ch- we did children's stories. It just depends, you know. As you go through your life, sometimes you have adult situations, then you have all ages situations. <laughs> I see. So, so that that's basically was it. Shandon had all these different things that happened. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, I I found there's an entry for you on the site Wikifur, uh, and it said uh, that your work is very explicit with its depictions of sexuality and violence, but he shies away from making his work pornographic. So it's kind of a something like you were kind of on a fine line there between kind of adult and porn. Not so, not porn though. Well, adult situations. Uh-huh. They got discussed occasionally in Shanda. And sometimes that was a good thing and sometimes that was a bad thing depending on the situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had uh, one character who had been abused by her brother and she eventually, through this, of course, the series, she stopped it and then went through a lot of uh, therapy on it. And we followed her through a therapy. Mm-hmm. So that was an adult situation. Yeah. Not not really a sexual situation, but an adult situation. Uh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, I mentioned furries. You know, a lot of people are kind of uncomfortable with the whole furry thing, and maybe just because people don't understand it very well. But um, what do you think is the attraction to the furry stuff? Huh. Um... Uh... Defending furry fandom, uh, it, it's, it's, it's just another it's just another form of fandom because if you say you're a science fiction fan and you go to a convention, you can uh, be interested in Star Trek, Star Wars, you know, uh, probably the Orville soon and uh, stuff like that. You know, then you all have subdivisions and you have people that like to dress up and you have people that like to write. You have all these different divisions. Well, furry fandom is just basically the same. Mm-hmm. We have fur suiters, people that dress in suits. We have people that write, people that draw, people that uh, role play in games, people that make jewelry for it, and such as that. That have a fursona, and some people that uh, are in it that don't don't have a fursona at all. And their only involvement it might be doing something creative that other people like. Mm-hmm. So it's just like any other fandom, really. Yeah. Now you've written for kind of several different genres. Uh, is there a genre that you like to read that you can't picture yourself working on? <laughs> I can I can tell you one that I didn't like to read, but I, that I had trouble picturing myself on. That's New Kids on the Block. <laughs> <laughs> well, I t- I t- a lot of times I'll I'll tell people when I talk to people about writing for comics, I always say. You at least one time in your career you're going to do something where you don't care a bit about the characters. You're just get you're there for the money and that's all. And that mm-hmm. with me it was New Kids on the Block. <laughs> so what kind of stories were you writing there? Is this sort of like uh, like the monkeys or? <laughs> that's exactly what I did do when I got a writer's guide. I noticed they uh, referred to this character character jordan knight being the davy jones of the group and they did a lot of cross-referencing and then i thought well that's what, that's easy what i'll do is i'll do a monkey story or a beetle story or a chipmunk story and then change it <laughs> and that way i could do new kids on the block stories sure okay because i didn't care about those characters a bit <laughs> <clears throat> well and they're real people but oh well and they're real people too. <laughs> mm, interesting. Um, now, I understand that you're a big collector of Superman memorabilia. Oh, very much so. 
like um, supposedly like you have the third biggest collection in the country or the world. I'm not sure. Like, what kind of stuff do you have? Uh, I have what I think, what I believe to be the third largest collection in the country. Although a couple of large collectors have come out, so I'm not sure anymore. Hmm. But in any case, it has all been donated to the uh, library in Cleveland. Oh, it's I see. It's all there. Hmm. And, uh, in fact, it's on exhibit now, uh, right now through uh, New Year's. I see. Wow. Okay. So these are all just kind of tie-in merchandise kind of things? Well, rarities, I always collected... I always collected to exhibit, like at libraries and schools and colleges and such as that. So I always tried to get things that people would be interested in and thinking, gee, that's an odd thing. Like the che- Superman cheese box <laughs> is a favorite thing. Wow. Yeah, uh, they made this Velveeta-type cheese with Superman on it. And uh, a, lot, a lot of collectors try to get the cheese box because it just looks so weird. <laughs> you know? <laughs> that's, a, that's a good way of putting it, but a lot of the things that... Uh, are in the exhibit at uh, the library. There's a George Reeves case, and I've got a ape symbol in there. I've got a uh, cast a life mask of him and an uh, autographed picture and a bunch of other things. Uh, and in another case, there's a Superman 2 raincoat with a Superman umbrella to go with it in case you got rain. You know, and so, so you see the hunt, basically thousands of items. Yeah, wow. So what 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 got you interested in in collecting Superman stuff? The time that I grew up in, uh, my mother was a, a single mother taking care of two kids, and uh, before she met my dad who adopted us, I I suppose she need, felt I needed a father figure, and she set me in front of the TV one day and said, "Watch that man in the cape." <laughs> so I did, and watched the show, and told her I enjoyed it very much, and she said, "Well, if you're good, you can watch it again, and if you're very good." They make funny books of him, and I'll buy you one, and you can read it anytime you want to. And I couldn't think of anything better to do than to have something, uh, a comic book of him that I could read anytime I wanted to. <laughs> so was, I started collecting. This was George Reeves' Superman? Yep. Were you a viewer of the Adam West Batman at all? I enjoyed it very much as a kid, yes. Hmm. It got a little silly at times, but I enjoyed it at the time. <laughs> it was not, just nice to see another character other than Superman in it. Hmm, okay. You know, in live action. Uh Uh-huh. I see. I mean, um, a lot of people who who have gotten into comics are, uh, you know, will cite that show as being a a big inspiration to them. Was was maybe Superman more your big inspiration? The Superman was my big inspiration. I mean, it was the TV show for me, even before the comics. I mean, when I saw... The origin episode, which is Superman on Earth, I had never, did not know Superman's origin. And I remember thinking, when's he going to rescue these people with their baby? (laughs) You know, since the planet is destroying, or destroying itself. So I didn't know, I thought, that that baby was going to turn out to be Superman. So, uh, yeah, I, I learned the origin. I learned the origin on the TV show. Check the show notes for links to both of the guests in this episode. Tell us what you think. Write us at mail at deconstructingcomics.com, Twitter at Decon Comics. Like our Facebook page or join our Facebook discussion group. All our social media links can be found on the right sidebar at deconstructingcomics.com. Also, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or iHeartRadio. We can also be found on our YouTube channel and at Comics Podcast Network at comicspodcast.com. And also, just recently, we have joined the ComicCon.com website. We have a partnership with them. Our episodes appear there a few days before they show up in our usual feed. Our theme is from bensound.com. In the latest episode of To the Bat Poles, some of the people I interviewed for Deconstructing Comics during my trip weigh in on Batman. They share their memories of watching Batman as kids and consider the question, what if someone else had played Batman? What did Adam West bring to the role? 
Also, none other than our very own mom shares her memories of watching us grow up with Batman and how her sewing skills helped us out on more than one occasion. Look up To The Bat Poles wherever you find your podcast or at tothebatpoles.libsyn.com. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us and Mulele and I will critique it on our spinoff podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com. We'll read at least 30 pages of it and critique it on the show. Critiquing Comics is released on the second and fourth Thursdays of the month, right here in this podcast feed. On Monday, more from my Billy Ireland Museum visit with Stephen Bissett, penciler of Alan Moore's Swamp Thing run, creator of the dinosaur comic Tyrant, and instructor at the Center for Cartoon Studies in Vermont. Craig Fisher, a university professor who writes for the Comics Journal and has been involved in comics convention organizing, and Tom Spurgeon, writer of the Comics Reporter blog and organizer of the Billy Ireland's annual Comics Crossroads Columbus event. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. <laughs>